Hi guys. <clears throat> um, let's talk about Ori and the Blind Forest. Um, I just I want to point out a uh, great microwave tree, which it sounds like maybe was a term coined by Day9, uh, but is amazing. Um, I, I, yeah, look at that. Um, okay. I mean, that's just, that's, I, I still don't, I like honestly don't understand that part at all. There are a number of parts of the backstory that I don't understand, like the, the plot of the game, the setup, the act one that I don't understand. Uh, and that is one of them is why we have a microwave tree. Doesn't matter. None of it matters. All right. <clears throat> you referred to the winds level, um, which, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I would think of it personally as like the magma level or the gravity level, but yes, it was the winds level as well. You referred to the winds level as a boss level. What made you think this was going to be one? The game has no concept of boss levels, just bosses and chases. Um, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that it does have a concept of boss levels, and I think that that was one. Uh, in the same way that the Jinso tree was one. Um, the pattern that I am seeing uh, is that um, each third of the game... So the game is divided into three parts. Uh, each... A uh, third of the game involves recovering some kind of a, like, stone that's out in the forest and then uh, restoring an element to power. Uh, and um, the culmination of each third of the game comes with a boss level uh, that is capped with a chase sequence um, and then possibly a boss... Uh, monster. I don't remember what the boss monster was, if there was one, for the for the water um, section. Uh, it does, it, I do feel like we had to do something weird with Gumo or Gumo summoned something. It's been a while since I played that, so I think there was like some kind of a boss at the end of that. But the boss level, as I would conceptualize it, and all of this, I mean, like, you know, we played the same game, so we're talking about the same things. I'm just um, using different terms to describe because I am categorizing things in slightly different ways. But here's so that you understand where I'm coming from, my perspective. The boss level uh, is the sequence right before the chase where the game takes some fundamental rules and changes them. Uh, it sort of, um, I'm trying to remember the, um, I mean, the, 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 the water boss level involved, um, having to go two ways up sort of the sides of the tree to break up the cobwebs? Um, or uh, thorns or something that were up at the top. And you were using um, the, uh, the bash move, which you had just learned. And you were using it to shoot from particle to particle, jumping around, um, which is not uh, something that is... Um, that's something that persisted then into the second third of the game. So uh, you may not view it the same way that I do as that was a, a fundamental rule breaking. Um, but it uh, the game was, that section really concentrated that mechanic. Uh, and that was a mechanic that we hadn't seen before. And um, it used it in uh, really interesting ways that Again, it's not that we haven't ever seen them since, but um, we were being introduced to them quick fire style. Uh, we were sort of uh, shown things um, uh, in a in a puzzly kind of a way, 
where we had to figure out how to get through segments using bash in different ways um, and chaining things together and doing all kinds of crazy stunts uh, and then we sort of completed that uh, and it culminates in the chase sequence one of the reasons that i really strongly categorize uh, like i break up the game this way with the boss level um, is because almost all of the game takes place in the same space there's no walls between where you are in one area and where you are in another area um, you can travel from like way over on this side of the map to way over on this side of the map and the all of the stuff that you're doing with the like um you know the the midpoint uh stones that you're gathering in each third of the game um each of those things is uh takes place in that outer world sorry i'm just gonna um and uh the the boss levels don't the boss levels involve going through a door that takes you into a separated space uh, that is somewhere outside or it's somewhere inside it's somewhere separated from the outside world uh, which is where everything else takes place and that's why I really see those as um, you know distinct as sort of like uh, categorically distinct I guess um, and in the second third it you know all of a sudden we're introduced to all of these crazy mechanics around gravity and uh, we have to carry this ice ball around and I don't know if some of those mechanics are going to persist they very well might like we might be playing with gravity in later parts of the game um, doesn't matter the way that they were introduced kind of all at once in that level in a way that that changes the kind of game that you are playing that you have been playing up to that point that's that's how i personally sort of define what the game is doing with with boss levels um but again a lot of it's semantics right i mean like we 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 had essentially the same experience um i just am, am drawing lines slightly differently um from Jason, uh, why did you name your cat Shiro? Where is that from? Um, so, uh, I mean, appropriately, I guess, for this game, um, I Shiro is about eight years old. Uh, Jesus, maybe like eight and a half now. Uh, I got her when she was a kitten, um, and I got her with a litter mate. Uh, I had two cats for a while, for a period of um, maybe even a couple of years, um, two or two or three years maybe, um, uh, and they were uh, both, you know, cute little short-haired domestic tuxedo cats uh, that looked pretty much identical as kittens, uh, except that one of them had a, a white stripe on her nose and the other one didn't. So I named them uh, Kuro and Shiro. Uh, Kuro meaning black in Japanese and Shiro meaning white. Uh, Sh Shiro uh, was the white cat, the, the, the black cat who had a white smudge on her nose, uh, as opposed to her sister Kuro, who was just completely black except for all of the white on her stomach. Um, so, I, you know, maybe not great names, but they worked for me. Um, Kuro uh, had a... Um, a genetic defect um, where she was missing a bunch of her internal organs uh, and um, that caused her uh, a number of health problems um, and uh, when I eventually moved out of the apartment where I was um, I was taking care of her and uh, moving with two cats was considerably more difficult than moving with one um, and she was her health was declining um, severely uh, and um, so in the end I had to um, hand her over to a shelter uh, where I did not follow up on her but I, I imagine she did not last for very long just because her health was so bad. Um, 
So uh, I lost one of my cats, uh, lost Kuro, and I've had Shiro ever since. Um, and Shiro's great. Um, she's, uh, yeah, she's, she's the, the one who was, Kuro was the one who was, like, really unstoppably cute, like, like, irresistibly cute, um, and also a total monster, uh, who would just, like, destroy everything in her path. Um, and Shiro is relatively, um, much calmer, um, and, uh, you know, actually probably an easier cat to, to have. Um, thank you, everybody in chat who is expressing sympathy. Um, uh, yeah, that was tough. That was, that was a, that was a tough period for me. Um, that, that, um, lined up pretty much with the, the period where I was living in the basement of, uh, the school for a little while, because, um, I lost my housing, um, which was also super fun. That was just a stressful semester. Um, okay. More questions. Did you feel like this part, the, the last part where you escaped Kuro, uh, intended you to run across the first time and die before, in, before realizing you could, uh, one, drop down, and two, push the log? Um, I, I don't know. That's a good question. I feel like that could have easily happened. Um, For me, I think uh, it had just, I had just gone by, like when I climb up the hollow tree, at the top of it, there is one of those like semi-permeable platforms that you can drop down through. And it's really obvious there because you have to jump up through it. Um, so they had just reminded me that those things exist. Uh, and then... It was clear that I had to run to the right because there was no other way to go, but it was also pretty clear that there was no shelter that way that I was going to make it to uh, unless that little section near the log was shelter. And so I, I felt like that's where I had to try to get. Um, the f I, I could easily see myself the first time just making a blind break for it and hoping that I would reach shelter before Kuro could swoop down and get me. Um, and I think if that happened, then I would immediately realize that I got nowhere near shelter um, and that I had to like, there was something that I was missing that I have to figure out. And dropping down just made sense. And then as soon as I got close to the wall, it said, you know, hold right to, hold right trigger to, to uh, push objects, um, which is probably something that I would not have figured out ever. Maybe not ever. Maybe it would have just taken me several tries of dying before I realized that I could push that if the game hadn't explicitly like popped that message up. But it did, so that made it pretty straightforward for me. Um, most, uh, so I think this is just Chris talking to me. Hugging the right-hand wall after the left-hand wall is not necessary in that part that I was talking about where you had to like predict where things were gonna fall. But most of it definitely required you to have preternatural knowledge of the situation for clarity. Hugging the left wall allowed the rocks to drop and break the barrier below. The second set of rocks would drop to prevent you from just standing there and analyzing your position, which you were able to do because you dodged the second set of rocks. I see. So if I had just dropped down, but at first I didn't realize that the first set of rocks had broken the thing below, and so I didn't just drop down. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but you guys still see sort of what I'm talking about, that in those sections, in the chase section, uh, the game changes its attitude towards your life as, like, truly disposable commodity. Um, here's a summary of the narrative as we understand it. Ori was swept away into the forest by a great storm. Naru found her. The tree was looking for Ori, shown its light to find her, because Ori is a tree spirit. Uh, so the tree is looking for her, shines the light to find her. That killed the baby owls for whatever reason. 
and also blinded Mama Owl. I think she's just blinded with rage. I don't think she's actually blinded. She does a lot of looking around for me. Um, I think her eye color just changed because she was really mad. Uh, the loss angered the Mama Owl, who then retaliated on the tree. And because of that, the forest died, darkness crept, creatures gave in to despair, and that's where all the monsters come from. Makes sense. And then Naru died. Oh, Naru's the, the, the mother who dies at the beginning. Got it. Uh, and then Ori, uh, before getting revived by the gathering of whatever little light was left from the tree. Sure. Okay. That kind of makes sense. The part where the the microwave tree still doesn't make sense. Um, like, at all, to me. I don't understand that. And then, um, yeah, okay, all right. That, 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 that works. Um, at this point in the game, nearing the end, after the wins level, you seem to do what I did on my playthrough and just wander off, gathering collectibles, uh, uh, experience points, cells, all of that kind of stuff. Are you doing that consciously? Am I doing that? Wait, have I had time to do that? I feel like I just finished the wins level. I, fe I feel like I haven't, I haven't done, like, really anything since I finished the wins level. Um, I did... I did kind of, like, take a detour at one point and fall down a pit uh, to get uh, a new, another life cell. Um, but I did not do that intentionally. I just thought that's where I was supposed to go. Uh, I probably would have known better if I had looked at the map. Although, in the whole winds level, there was, like, this thing where uh, my actual destination wasn't marked on the map. So I, I kind of had to explore everything. Um, or I would have if I hadn't been doing it and found the thing that I was looking for just by kind of exploring everything. Um... Now that said, I do, I think I go through phases where um, I'm more intent on completing the story or more intent on just kind of exploring around. Here's my personal pattern though, like just from experience, what I've learned. Um, as I get further into the game, I am more and more likely to just want to finish it. Um, so I feel like there was a section maybe right after I finished the first third, after I finished the water, um, you know, boss section, uh, and started in on the second third when I just wandered around a lot and I wanted to explore a lot of the overworld map, uh, and I was just looking for stuff that I could find and get. Um, and certainly I, like... If I see things that I can try to get, I, I'm not going to just pass them up. Um, like, I, I'll go after stuff that I find. Um, but that's been true the whole time, I think. I think that's been pretty consistent. I think there was a section after, right after the first third of the game where I did a little bit more wandering. And I just sort of, like, looked around for stuff that I could, I could get. Um, and now I feel much more directed. Like... Uh, it, so I, in the same way that after the water temple level, the Jinso tree, um, I got like released from the boss level, what I understand is the boss level, uh, which is extremely contained and directed. Um, I was released back into the overworld where I have tons of freedom. I can just go wherever I want. And the first time that that, ha that happened, I felt the desire to take advantage of that and like just wander around um, and explore. And this time I'm having the, the same experience of being released back into the overworld where I have a lot more freedom. Um, and I am, I am uninterested in wandering around and exploring. I just wanna like, where where is my next objective? Let me go there. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. I like, I, I, the first thing that I did was look at the map and try to figure out, okay, which way should I go to get to the the warmth, whatever that I'm trying to get to? 
Um, so I definitely have the same experience of like, you know, going through phases like that. Um, but I think my phases are maybe a little bit different than yours in terms of timing. And, um, and I think that's my general pattern. And that's not just in this game. That's actually, that's how I generally play any kind of a game, any kind of a game that has a significant grinding aspect like this game does. Um, so I've never finished a Final Fantasy game, but I have played a couple of them for a number of hours. Um, and my pattern with that is that uh, starting at the beginning of the game, I do as much grinding as I can sort of stand to do. Um, while I'm playing, and I do that by like wandering around and exploring nooks and crannies and things. Um, and then as soon as I get to a section in a Final Fantasy game where I am not high enough level to continue, I'm, I'm pretty much done with the game. Like, I'm, I'm out. Um, so I, I have to do all of my grinding ahead of time because if I feel like I have to grind to progress, I, I stop caring. Um, in, a, in like a, a Bethesda game or a Bioware game, um, I will do a, a ton of exploring early on. I'll just sort of ignore the quest objectives for a while. Like when I'm, when I'm given free reign to explore, I'll do a lot of exploring. Um, and then as I get probably right around here, probably around like the two thirds mark where I, I can sort of see the end of the game coming up. Um, I stop exploring nearly as much. I stop going after secondary objectives uh, nearly as much um, and start focusing on like, okay, let's finish the game now. Um, and I think to a certain, yeah, hi. Yeah, the, there are drawers and, and doors and cabinets and all sorts of things. That's right. Um, I think to a certain extent, like once I hit that point for me, um, if I don't finish the game pretty quickly, then I just lose interest. And so I know that like, all right, this is now I got to do it. Now I have to like get to the end because otherwise I'm never going to. Um, Skyrim, I got like 95% of the way through that game because I, I explored and like did random shit for hours and hours and days. Uh, and then finally got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like buckle down and get to the end. Um, and I went through the main quest line up until like 95% of the way through. And that's when I, that was my limit. Like that I just ran, I, I, I ran out the clock. Uh, like that was, I had spent too long on that game. I wanted to do something else. Uh, and so I never actually finished it. Uh, I assume at the end you turn into a dragon and you enslave the world. Um, that's that's my fanon ending of Skyrim. Um, okay. You've been talking about how the game is increasingly visually complex com compared to earlier play. When does that sort of thing become cumbersome rather than helpful to the player? And where do you think the game is getting it right or wrong at this point with so many different mechanics available? Um, that's my microphone. Are you, you want to say something? You want to say something? Do you want to just stand here in front of my keyboard? You want to just do whatever you're doing? Okay. Um, so this is an amazing question. Um, come on down. Let's get down. Let's go down. Thank you. Um, in every part, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, I've been talking about how the game is increasingly visual complex. Um, I don't think that I said that. Uh, because I, I don't think that I have actually put that together. But you're 100% right. Um, the, the, what I have been describing 
uh, visually, I, what I've been getting excited about has been increasingly complex as the game goes forward. Um, and uh, that is that you can map out that arc. And I, I wasn't thinking about it in dynamic terms, in terms of like, it was simpler at the beginning and it's gotten increasingly complex, but that's, that's exactly what's happened. And that's really actually an interesting sort of... Um, knob for the game to turn as it goes forward. Uh, okay, so then um, when does that sort of thing become cumbersome rather than helpful to the player? Uh, and where do you think the game is getting it right and wrong at this point? Well, so for one thing, I would say uh, I think this is probably exactly why I, am, I had more trouble today uh, with distinguishing foreground and background elements that I've had previously. I think it's because in general, the game is getting more and more visually complex. And so it's harder to distinguish those elements. There are more visual elements on the screen. Um, they're more detailed. They're more, there's more, the distinctions between them are subtler. Uh, and so um, it's harder and harder to actually um, see some of the mechanically distinct or systemically distinct elements. Um, and that's, I, I personally see that as a problem. I think that uh, unless your design is for the visual complexity of the game to obscure the, the mechanical elements, the things that the player is actually going to interact with, um, which is rarely the intent. Uh, and unless that's your intent, then your number one responsibility with designing the visual feel of a game is to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, and generally, Ori is great at it. I mean, you know, in terms of the length of game that I have played, the number of different uh, situations I've encountered, um, and the number of times that I've actually had trouble parsing them, um, is it's not super high. Uh, but it has happened a couple times, and it's been happening more and more frequently. Uh, I think that is true. And so that's something that I would say, like, the game should probably uh, have looked at, have um, been careful about where it's adding complexity and cleaned up some of these specific things um, that I had trouble with because I think there was ambiguity that was a little bit too tricky. Um, I mean, generally, it's still doing a really good job, but uh, the, as the visual complexity increases, it is um, more and more likely that I'm going to miss something in it. Um, and I don't feel like that's the point of the game. I don't feel like this is a, a game that's, um, you know, that, that really, that's a core element of it. Certainly, there's like parsing things that are happening, but it's mostly like understanding things that happen um, as they happen quickly and reacting to them quickly. Uh, and it's less about sort of like the artwork obscuring important elements. That doesn't feel like it's um, endemic to this game. Um, and then uh, in addition to sort of visual complexity, the mechanical complexity, right? With so many different mechanics available, uh, at what point does that become cumbersome rather than helpful? And the game, I feel like, is really walking that line. And it's doing it pretty well. Uh, like, I, I can't really complain about it. Um, I have, when I'm just like walking around like normal, I have a fuck ton of special abilities. Um, but, and I, and I think that the game rushes me through some of them. Um, from the bash ability, the stomp ability, the feather ability, and the climb ability, like that whole section where I learned all of those, those all came like fucking rapid fire. Um, I learned them all real quick. And each one had a distinct area where I could like learn how to use it and practice it and see how it would be put into play. Uh, but that 
there wasn't a lot more than that. It was kind of like, here is your tutorial on the stomp, um, and now you have a new ability, and you're going to have to learn that. Uh, and um, it's not until, you know, now that I feel really comfortable with the feather and the wall climb. Uh, like, I feel very comfortable with the bash, uh, because I've been using that all over the place. But it takes a while to become really comfortable with a new mechanic, with a new action that you can take as a player. Uh, and the game, I feel like, has rushed a little bit through some of those. Um, that said, they are all really well designed, except for the stomp. Uh, and they fit together really well, except for the stomp. Um, and... Um, you know, they all, they, they feel like they reinforce the same sorts of core aesthetics, like mechanical and um, kinesthetic aesthetics for the character. Uh, the way that she moves uh, on the ground and through the air, um, like it, all of these abilities resonate with that. Um, so they feel really, really good. And then the game does a great job, like I talked about, of, um, hey, here's something completely different. Here's something 100% different, um, but you don't need to worry about most of the special abilities that you have. Just sort of forget those for the time being and deal with this other thing. We're going to flip gravity around all over the place, and that's going to be really confusing, and you're going to have to use 100% of your brain to, like, figure that out, to process it from moment to moment. But don't worry, we're not going to have you, like, wall climbing or bash jumping or, like, doing any of this other crazy shit. Uh, all you will be doing is walking around upside down on ceilings. Um, and that's that's really cool. Like, that, that was really super smart to like trim everything back so that I could learn how to do that and I could execute on that in its own space. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Um, Adam Prime is describing uh, their understanding of the great microwave tree. Um, So, oh, because Naru has sort of taken Ori into her care, the tree calls louder and louder and louder uh, because Ori isn't responding to the call. And eventually it's calling so loud that it, um, uh, you know, it, it, it reaches the energy limit of baby owls. I guess. Uh, yeah. Okay. But um, but the egg is fine. Like I, I whatever. I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm pretty sure that it doesn't make sense. Uh, and so I'm not gonna like try to make it make sense. I'm just gonna let it go because I don't I don't need to. Yeah, baby owl resonance frequency. Exactly. That's I um. I, that's that's fine. That's fine. It doesn't need to make sense. Uh, the game is great without an actual story. Uh, like and the narrative of the game, the the way that the game plays out from moment to moment is also great. Um, it's just the plot doesn't make any sense, and that's it's okay. I. I, there's a part of me that wishes that it hadn't tried so hard because it didn't need to. Um, but on the other hand, those cutscenes, like that first cutscene with Naru and, uh, and the cutscene with the baby owls were amazingly em emotional. Uh, like it, it's, those were high points of the game. Those are strong moments. Um, and so I'd hate to lose those just because they make no fucking sense. Um, okay, cool. All right, I think that's it for me. Thanks, everybody. Um, I am now definitely two-thirds of the way through the game. Uh, if 
um, my theater training is correct, then the last third will probably be shorter than the other two, but it will also probably be quite a bit harder. So um, we'll see if I ever get through it. Maybe I will. Um, the, I think the chances of me streaming Mass Effect this weekend are pretty low. I have a presentation uh, on Monday that I need to make. Um, so, uh, uh, but we'll see that maybe there will be more surprise Mass Effect streams in the future. Um, I enjoyed doing that. Um, and I would enjoy playing through, uh, I, I think like it'd be fun in my head, the way that this works out is, uh, is I play, um, you know, a bit of Mass Effect until I get tired, until I run out of things to say essentially, because I would totally play through that game again by myself, but I, I feel like at some point I would stop having anything to say on stream, and then I would just get really self-conscious about playing it and, like, not having anything to say. And so whenever that happens, and I feel like that, then I'll just um, pop in Mass Effect 2, and we'll, we'll, we'll play through some of the trilogy. I think that would be super fun, but again, I'm thinking that I'll do it on off time, so I don't know when that's ever going to happen. Um, so yeah, Follow me on Twitter, stay on top of it, just like sit by your computer at all times, watching uh, for when I say, hey, I'm gonna start streaming Mass Effect because then maybe it'll happen at some point. Um, thanks everybody, thanks for the questions. This was great, this is a lot of fun. Uh, I look forward to next week. Um, have a great night.